I think technology is wonderful. I just got I have this little watch, you know, that you get that's hooked to your phone and stuff. Well, anyway, my wife just sent me a, a nice little thing that she said she just said a prayer for me. And I thought that was very sweet. She's in California with her sister Carol today and be back home, I hope, tonight because their weather out there is just terrible. So anyway, if you're on, hi, sweetie. <laughs> Okay, today we're back to the, uh, the Beatitudes. Uh, again, I'm going to repeat myself and say that uh, there's a, uh, a big difference between what Christ's intent was with the Beatitudes and what my first reading was and my feeling. I can remember my whole life reading the Beatitudes and just thinking, how poetic. It's beautiful words. I feel so good about them, you know? And uh, I couldn't have been more wrong about some of the meanings. And I'm just so grateful that we had this, this study that uh, we've gone through the past months. And uh, I just want to uh, talk today about the uh, blessed are the, the peacemakers. So what does peacemaker uh come to mind, you know, when you, when you first think about it. For, for my first one, it says, these are the people that are awarded annually a prize from a, uh, Alfred Nobel in uh, Norway, and that they are the, uh, the Nobel Peace Prize. There's some, been some very amazing awards for that Henry Kissinger. I don't know if you remember when my age, I mean, he was a very, he was more Secretary of State, and he negotiated uh, actually the end of the Vietnam War. Um, another one that uh, was in there was Jimmy Carter. Bless him that, uh, as he nears the end of his life, that he will go down as one of our peacemakers. And uh, <clears throat> the second point I think about is these are people whose personalities and skills uh, involve themselves in, in disputes, and they talk uh, they enter into opposing positions, and uh, they try to create rational discourse where, where none exists. They, they promote respectful disagreement. Um, this is indeed a part of a spiritual gift of healing, and uh, that is restoring hostility to wholeness, fear, reducing fear to faith, and uh, changing suspicion to trust. And those things are, I think, earmarks of, of a peacemaker. The third thing that comes to mind was the much feared and respected six shooter manufactured by Colonel Samuel Colt. Okay? As the saying goes, God created all men equal. Sam Colt made them equal. Actually, this is quite the antithesis to today's message. Uh, it's absolutely opposite. <laughs> Sam Colt doesn't have anything to do with being a peacemaker. <laughs> okay, so uh, as we get started here, we're going to... Uh, get started right. Okay. Christ... Uh, says, blessed are the peacemakers, referring particularly to bringing men into harmony with God. Uh, again, we don't instantly understand one of Christ's great thesis statements that he made in the Beatitudes. But here's the most important thing that I will speak to today. If you don't remember anything else today, please remember this. Being a peacemaker means bringing men into harmony with God. It seemed like a good idea to print these out on paper, but my thumb, I can't turn my pages. Anyway, sorry. Um, here's the, uh, just a minute. There we go. Okay, this is a crowded slide that is sort of uh, off-putting. But anyway, this young man's mind, we see a picture in his mind that on the, 
The one side we see Satan, and he's in an arm wrestling match with Christ on the other side. And uh, this is true to the from, the from the earliest story, this is common to what this church has been preaching for many years, that there's a struggle between Satan and God. And, uh, and continues on to say that the carnal mind is en- enmity, enmity against God. I'm not going to use that word a lot more because I can't pronounce it, but it means that uh, where there is sin in your mind, God has a hard time being there. Okay. And so I want to read here Romans 6, chapter 8, verses 6 and 8. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed ever can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Blessed are the peacemakers. The peace of Christ is born of truth. It is harmony with God. The world is at enmity with the law of God. Sinners are at enmity with their maker. And as a result, they are at enmity with one another. This is from Ellen White in The Desire of Ages. Okay. We know that Satan lies. Okay? We know that he attacks God's character so that man may, may lack faith and lack trust in our almighty God. And this picture here, it's, it's, you can't see it really well, but what it shows is that in the clouds of glory is, is our maker. and He's coming in these fearsome warriors are crouched down cowering because they fear God. Do they have the right impression of who God really is? Is God a loving God or is God a vindictive God that is coming to rub us out? (laughs) Only like can appreciate like. Okay, that means that um, if I like... I can appreciate when somebody has like, okay? So if I like good food, I can appreciate good food. My mother, she ate simply to survive. She couldn't care less about food. So did she have the ability to appreciate good food? No. Unless you accept in your own life the principle of self-sacrifice, Self-sacrificing love, giving up my own, myself to help others, okay? That's the principle of God's character. And without that, you cannot know God. Okay, the heart is deceived by Satan. It looks upon God as a tyrannical, relentless being, the selfish characteristics of humanity, even of Satan himself, are attributed to our loving creator, mistakenly. It's a lie. His providences are interpreted as an expression of an arbitrary and a vindictive nature. So with the Bible, the treasure house of the riches of his grace, the glory of his truths, they're as high as heaven, and they encompass eternity, but they're characterized incorrectly. The devil does that to drive us from God so that God can't be part and that we can't partake in God's riches and his love. So to the great mass of mankind, Christ himself is a root out of dry ground and they see him no, and they see in him no beauty where they should desire him. Isaiah 53 verse 2. John 8, 4, 4 says, you are of your father. And this is God talking. He was talking to the Pharisees, okay? And he says, you are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do, to live in the world. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth. 
because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. For Satan is indeed a liar and the father of it. Even Christ's disciples were so blinded by selfishness of their own selves, their own hearts, that they were slow to understand Jesus, who had come to manifest them in their Father's love. This is why Jesus walked in solitude a great deal of his time on earth. He was understood fully in heaven alone. Only in heaven did they understand truthfully why Jesus was here. But Christ, the Prince of Peace, the Master Peacemaker, came to show men that God is not their enemy. He was the messenger of peace from God to man. Isaiah tells us this starting in verse 9, or in chapter 9, verse 6. It says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. The next is just a picture. I love this picture. I saw it and I said, I'm going to put it in there. And here we have a good picture, a representation of the Prince of Peace. He was the messenger of peace from God, sent by God to man, to let man know who actually God is. Christ is the Prince of Peace. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now may the Lord of Peace himself give you peace always in every way. The Lord will be with you all. These are promises. It is his mission to restore to earth and heaven that which has been lost to sin. Whoever consents to renounce sin and open his heart to the love of Christ becomes a partaker of this holy heavenly peace. Again, from Ellen White, from Thoughts on the Mount of Blessings. Whoever consents to renounce sin. So the first step, we must not want or like sin. And what do we have to do? We have to open our heart to the love of Christ. We have to invite Christ in. And we have to become a partaker of his heavenly peace. What broke peace? Sin. Satan. Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace through God, through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so is this process possible? Are we a peacemaker without Jesus? We cannot have, we don't have that ability. We're sinful creatures. Through Christ we can, and through Christ we will. So let's take a step back now and look a little bit what Jesus was, was in, in the, on the mount. He said, And blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. The spirit of peace is evidence of their connection with heaven. The sweet savor of Christ surrounds them, the fragrance of the life, the loveliness of his character, reveal to the world the fact that they are children of God. Men take knowledge of them that they have been with Jesus. Everyone that loveth is born of God. If any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Without Christ, we cannot be with God. But as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Men cannot manufacture peace. And this is where I fell down a bit 
with the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, I, I've held that at a lofty, lofty goal. What's this say? Ellen White says, men cannot manufacture peace. Okay? Human plans for the purification and uplifting of individuals or of society will fail of producing peace because they do not reach the heart. The only power that can create or perpetuate true peace is the grace of Christ. When this is implanted in the heart, it will cast out evil passions that cause strife and dissension. Instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree, and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. And life's desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. And then it continues on for the last sentences. But the psalmist declares, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. So if we are with Jesus, we've asked him to come into our life, and we're working for peace with others to help them enjoy that peace that Christ has given us. Um, we know his law. We keep his law. And despite all our trials and our setbacks that we will experience in trying to bring this message to others, we won't be offended by them because we know what we're up to, what we're accomplishing, and that Christ is there helping us. Blessed are the peacemakers is talking about me. Okay? I must enter into God's peace. Okay? That peace comes through Jesus and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And But by the Holy Spirit and Jesus, we're not getting there, folks. So the Holy Spirit takes the truth concerning God and him whom he has sent and opens it to the understanding and to our heart. The pure in heart see God in a new and endearing relationship as their redeemer and while they discern the purity and loveliness of God. But the hearts that have become purified through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, all is changed. Are we the same people? No. We have left the world and we have entered the world of Christ. Moses was hid in the cleft of the rock when the glory of God was revealed to him. And it was thus when we are hid in Christ that we behold the love of God. Matthew 5, 9 says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. We've established a little bit about the peacemakers now, for they shall be called sons of God. What is, he, what is that message stating? What is the verse promising? In the other Beatitudes, we have a promise. We have a statement, and then we have a promise, usually. Is this a promise? Is he promising anything? The verse is saying that to be a son of God means to resemble God in character. If we live in Jesus, we are the sons of God. First John chapter 3, verse 2 says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed... We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Like can appreciate like. So without being like Jesus, can we appreciate God and what God has given us? No. That's why it's so important for us to abandon sin and accept Christ. We must personally, each one of us, come to peace with God. We are devoted to the cause of leading others to be in peace with him as well. Why are we sitting here today? Most of us have accepted Jesus. Most of us are wanting Jesus in our heart. We want to do better. We don't want to sin. You know, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir. 
Um, this is the story that we should be sharing daily with the people in the world that are part of the world and are not part of Christ. People who don't know about this. People who don't have any clue what they are missing. We are devoted to being the cause of leading others to be in peace with God as well. How can I be at odds with myself and convey the love of God for his children? That's the one. Am I at peace? Have I put sin far enough away that I can resemble Jesus' plan, God's plan for us? I don't know. That's one that we have to work on daily. And that's why we need prayer. And that's why we need to ask the Holy Spirit to be there for us to help us eliminate that sin from our lives so that we can fully help others come to God. How can we help others find who God really is if we're not living the character of God? How probable is it that we say, hey, do you want to know about God? Come belly up here to the bar and have a beer. You know, I mean, is that, that is not going to cut it. Okay, we have to exemplify Christ's being in our own selves before we're going to be accepted by others and say, you know, I admire what that guy's like, you know. I, I appreciate the fact that he doesn't use foul language in every story. I appreciate the fact that he stopped and helped that person, you know, fix their flat tire. I admire that. You know, and those are the kinds of things that we need to exhibit to others if we are to be successful in bringing others to know the love of God. So I put down here the last thing. Who is this guy telling me to turn from the world? Another sinful soul. Who is it? Well, it's another sinful soul opening others' hearts to Jesus. You know, each one of us want to help others renounce sin and do what? Invite Christ into their heart. And this is one that I put in there. It's, it's redundant, but it's also very reassuring. It says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on each of us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know him. So, we have all the possessions in the world. I have 100,000 acres of the best farmland in the world. I have every car I ever wanted. I have more money in the bank than most small countries. Okay? And what have I? I don't have what God has given us, each one of us, just by the asking. Because he has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. And when we're called children of God, we will be with God. We are awarded the highest prize, better than any Nobel Peace Prize. Knowing him and having the love that God has for us brings tears to my eyes. What greater reward than to be one of God's children? Now, on the other hand, this verse says that the rest of the world may not be there. Who are, who are not living in God's love? can't understand this reward because they do not know God and God's love for his children. Okay? Their, folks, is our challenge and our purpose. Devotion to leading others to know God so they too can be his children. Okay, we go back to one that we have already talked about when Christ addressed the Pharisees and basically told them they were the son of Satan and who's was a liar, okay? So, so what was Christ up to in preaching on the mount that day? To assemble this, to understand this beatitude, Jesus is talking to the Jews assembled on the mountain who are listening to a man claiming to be the Messiah, but not fully understanding because they don't know God. So when Christ started, he started as we will with people who are part of the world and not already part of God's life. 
The multitudes were amazed at Christ's teaching, which was so at variance with the precepts and the example of the Pharisees. The people had come to think that happiness consisted in the possession of things of this world and that the fame and the honor of men were to be much coveted, to be called rabbi, to be extolled as a wise and religious person, having their virtues paraded before the public. That's their experience. That was their worldly experience. Does anybody seen the pictures of Pharisees? I sometimes giggle when I see them there in these beautiful, long, flowing robes. And oftentimes they're quite corpulent, you know, because of the lifestyle. And a lot of them had amazing hats. Um, we thought cowboy hats were big. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they did this as an outward display of their piousness, of their knowledge, of their learning. It was tough to be one of them because they had to know a tremendous amount. And that's all the people knew at the time, thinking that was success. Okay, It was very pleasing to be called rabbi and to be extolled as wise and religious and they paraded before everybody in the public. This was rewarded as the crown of happiness, but in the presence of that vast throng, Jesus declared that earthly gain and honor were all the reward such persons would ever receive. He spoke with certainty and a convincing power that attended his words. He was telling them that you can lay up all this stuff and have the prettiest garments and and the most knowledge and stuff, that isn't the reward, folks. He was saying, that's temporal. That, that ends with the earth and your life. The real life is being forever with God. So is conflict born of knowing God or is conflict born of the world? Here's a picture of something that all too often is the case. I know it's been in my life before where there are those loud disagreements where there's not a meeting of the minds and uh, I'm not backing down. Somebody else in the picture says they're not backing down and uh, the fur flies. Is any part of that knowing God? Is any part of that living the life that Christ would have us leave, live? No. Where's that coming from? That's coming from the world. Blessed are the peacemakers. The peace of Christ is born of truth and harmony with God. So when we have enmity and we see people here arguing and in conflict like that, are we seeing truth? No. What we're seeing here is something else, sin. We don't know maybe which one, but sin is involved. And so the next time, and I keep telling myself and I keep killing, killing myself on this one, the next time I get into it with somebody, I have to think about, whoa, take a step back. What's this about really, you know? Is this about Jesus? Or is this about some pride that I have? Or some transgression upon some value that I hold near and dear to the world? But it's just something to think about. As you see conflict and you see war, what's the deal with Russia and Ukraine? We know there's a war. It's a horrible conflict. It's a terrible thing. Did it come from God? So why can't people see what is it that drives this? Well, it's something worldly. And to fix that problem, first they have to fix the thinking of the country involved. The world is at enmity with the law of God. The world doesn't like that. It's restrictive. They can't do what people want to do when they want to do it. They're at enmity with their maker. They're against God. Do you want to be against God? I don't want to be against God. And as a result, they're at enmity with each other. So I had another slide that I put together, and this is just Tom Cowan speaking. It says, sin equals the need for peacemakers. Where sin exists, we are needed, okay? 
Are we needed in the pews? Yes, we are, because every week we should worship and we should thank God for what he has given us. But also, we need to be where there is sin and we need to be the peacemaker. We need to be there to help people understand what it is that's causing their conflict in the very beginning. Are they walking with Christ or are they walking with the world? So I took this back to a little bit of some of my experiences as a manager and a human resources employee. Um, the number one problem that I used to find at work when we had two, two employees tearing each other's hair out or, or throwing chairs at one another, what, it wasn't that bad, but still you had no productivity from their work unit because they were more consumed with battling one another than they were of achieving what they're supposed to at work. Okay, and uh, nine times out of 10, the telltale sign was emotion. When people emote, um, that is one of the things I do not see coming from Christ. When you holler at someone, when you make a dirty dig under your breath at somebody, um, these are the things very common at work. You know, when we have a conflict between two people at work, the first thing that we tried to do, and the first thing we often tried, we would send them home. We'd say, look, you're having a bad day, and we didn't put it on them. I mean, it was like, look, you're having a bad day. This is not a good thing for the office, so I would like you to go home, and I would like you to rest and think about this, and I want you to come in at 9 o'clock in the morning and meet with me in my office, you know? Don't worry about it. Just come on in at 9. We're not going to yell and holler, but by that time, your temper will cool off. Okay, that's one of the best and easiest steps you can do as a peacemaker where there's true enmity and there's a conflict going on and heads are button. Ring the, ring the emotion out of it, okay? The second thing is what really is the problem, okay? Um, is there a, a health issue involved here? Somebody has got bad news about their health, somebody doesn't feel good. Um, somebody in their family doesn't feel good and they're feeling pressure. Is something like that motivating this kind of behavior? Okay. Has somebody been hurt by what they said? You know, did you see her skirt? That was the ugliest thing I have ever seen. You know, they feel hurt. Okay. And that leads to that kind of a problem. Envy. Yeah, he drives that really cool Porsche, <laughs> you know. Um, that's envy, you know, and that too leads to enmity because that's of the world and not of Christ, okay? So you got to look and think inequity. Oh, they don't work as hard. I put out 14 filings a day to their six. That is not fair. That is not equal. No, and you aren't the same person as they are. And you didn't see how much long they, they spent on the telephone with clients assisting them. And so, you know, those are kind of things that create enmity. But we have to understand what underlies it. And the next day when they came in my office at 9, these were the sort of things that I wanted to talk about. What's going on with your life? You know, what's going on? And oftentimes they would be cooled off and they would say, yeah, that's right. Um, I'm just having a bad day and... Uh, I wrecked the car and my wife left me and my dog died and, you know, all that stuff, you know, kind of deals. So understand that people have feelings. They're human, okay? And uh, another often thing I used to ask was, what is being produced, okay? So when two people are going out, you ask, what are you accomplishing here? What are you producing? You know, and the, the only thing they can answer is, well, nothing, you know, or... We're, we're just expending energy at no, and achieving nothing. And so that's another way to approach it is that, look, you're not getting anywhere. This isn't accomplishing a darn thing. So let's take a step back and let's try this again tomorrow. Okay? Don't take sides or all is lost. As a manager, I could never say, you know, Bob has it right and I think you're wrong. You know, how does that work? How well does that work? <laughs> no. Your, your credibility just went boop. <laughs> um, you, so really, in, in a, as a peacemaker, we have to be fair. We have to be even. And we don't lay the blame on one or the other. It takes two to get into an argument, right? So what we do is we resolve that, it, that emotion. And the next day, it's a lot easier to say, look, I don't have a dog in this fight. 
but I'll tell you, this is the way I see it, okay? And that oftentimes help people look at themselves and say, yeah, I'm in the wrong. You know, they, they realize that we don't even have to tell them they're in the wrong. They see it, okay? Maybe somebody else is better to mediate this, okay? Um, maybe those aren't some of my favorite employees, okay? And maybe we've had run-ins ourselves, okay? And so maybe it's better for me to call Kendra and say, you know, Kendra, would you please uh, handle this because I'm a little bit too close to it. So don't be afraid to step back and let somebody else come in that, that has an objective opinion on this, okay? Always, 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 on that next day at nine, come in, find the common ground, okay? You feeling better today? Whoop, right there's your common ground. Well, yeah, you feel better today. Start developing the common ground until they see that there isn't such an insurmountable mountain between the two of them. You know, they have the same emotions, they have the same problems in life. The more they share in common ground, the more apt that they are to see they're wrong and that let this go and move on, okay? Sometimes that doesn't ever happen. We must just agree to disagree how often that's the case. And then one other one in here that I, I haven't talked about was, um, how does everybody feel about compromise? In my opinion, in my experience, compromise is a short-term solution and it's never lasting. Compromise works very good maybe in the short term, but ultimately, if you don't resolve the issues underlying, they're gonna come back and they're gonna bite. So. It's a good thing, it's a good tool to use in the short term, but don't rely on compromise to, be, to achieve the final end to a disagreement. So at this point, this isn't very bright, but there's a bright line now on the screen, okay? And it's kind of dim, but <laughs> anyway, knowing God and living as one of his children is on one side of that line, and on the other side of the line, doesn't know God and lives in the world, okay? This is kind of binary, okay? This is not a difficult thing to comprehend, okay? Which side of this line must we live on, okay? If we live on the worldly side, don't expect a lot of comfort in life. You're not gonna share in God's peace. Living above the line, we know where that comes from. We know that comes from Jesus. Walk with him, and you'll share at least his peace, maybe the understanding. Can you live with one leg on each side of the fence, on each side of the line? Can I say, okay, I've got one here, and I've got one here, okay? Um, I like certain things in the world, and I like certain things in Jesus, you know? We're conflicted, and neither one of the sides likes us. We have to choose one or the other, okay? It's kind of the, the do year, don't you, you know? And finally here, we're talking about Christians are to be at peace amongst themselves, okay? In John 14, 27, it says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. What more can we ask for? Not be afraid and not be troubled because Jesus is with us. Okay? Um, I just left this slide. Another slide I put in there because I like the picture. It shows Jesus and you're walking on the water. And uh, the verse I tagged onto it was James 3.18. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. And in that picture, Christ is walking on the water, and what did he do? There was a horrible storm, and the waves were terrible, and the boat was taken on water. Did Jesus worry? He knew it was under control. And what did he do? He calmed the waters. And that he will do in our lives as well. And that's how he will help us become peacemakers. So in fine, in, on the last slide here, I'm, this is a direct ripoff of Billy Graham. Um, Billy Graham said, to be a peacemaker, 
You must know the peace giver. Again, the fact that we're not the one giving the peace. It's Christ that gives the peace. And if they don't know Christ, they can't accept the peace because like, no appreciates like, you know. So in First Thessalonians, my, my, I want to close with um, chapter 5, verses 11 to 15. And it says, Therefore comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. And we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor amongst you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, exhort you. Brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfortable or comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all. See that no one renders evil for evil, but always pursue what is good for both for yourselves and for all. Thank you for your attention today. It's short, but I learned a lot today about myself. And that's what I hope everybody here learns too. We have to have Christ in our heart. And our job is not to, to keep that in our heart and be thankful for peace, but to help others share that, people who don't share that peace in their lives. Well, that's what makes us the children of God. Thank you.